All right, what is going on, adventurers? It has been quite a while since the last Adventure One podcast. I hope everybody is well. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Goodness, the last episode I recorded was the Laguna Atascosa Adventure Series. So in that series, goodness, we were definitely doing it the hard way. It was me, Kyle, and Daniel, and we went down to the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge with archery gear, chasing white-tailed deer and nilgai antelope on our bicycles, going miles back, doing all-day sits, sweating it out in the Texas heat, and getting eaten by chiggers and ticks, it seemed like, the whole time. So it was a super fun hunt. It was a tough hunt, but it was a fun one, and we recorded an episode every night. So if you've got some time, maybe you're taking a road trip or working on something at home, just play that series in the background. It's a fun one to tune in and listen to. So today I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit more normal in the world of hunting, uh, not taking a bow and a bicycle, but in fact, using a muzzle loader. So I know there are some guys out there who are muzzleloader experts. They are muzzleloader hunters. It's what they do. It's how they hunt. That's not me. I feel like a lot of you may be listening to this just to kind of learn more about muzzleloaders, learn more about, you know, what do I need? Um, Here's some experience from a guy who wasn't really in that world, who was getting into that, learning more about it learning what you need, how to make your system accurate, and why you would even want to hunt with a muzzleloader. So that's kind of how I'm intending this podcast to go, just kind of talking about my experience getting into the world of muzzleloader hunting. So as I typically do, I'd first like to start with the why. So why on earth in 2020 would you hunt with a muzzleloader when you could use a modern rifle? So for me, and I think for a lot of folks out there, the biggest and most convincing reason is access and extending your season. There are a lot of places that don't allow centerfire rifles to hunt. You can only hunt there with a muzzleloader or a shotgun. There are whole states like this. Uh, In my world, it's just a small piece of National Forest Service land that's close to me that I've, I've bow hunted there. I've killed a deer there with a bow and with a muzzleloader. And that's kind of why I got into this. In addition to access, I mentioned extending your season. There are a lot of states, Texas included, where there is an additional muzzleloader only season. So if you hunt archery season, you hunt rifle season, well, you can get an extra week or two out of your season by picking up a different weapon and going at it a little bit differently, not too terribly differently, but a little bit differently just to get out and enjoy a little bit more hunting. So those are the main reasons I think for most people. I think there are some people who just enjoy the thrill of it. I kind of found that it, it was fun getting it up and running, uh, figuring out what powders and projectiles I like, shooting something that makes a big boom and a whole bunch of smoke. It, it's kind of cool just to use it. Um, but t- for me, that was a little bit secondary to just extending my season and increasing my access. So that's kind of the why behind my experience in muzzleloader hunting. So primarily to extend my access, but I also found it to be pretty fun. So I enjoy archery and now I even enjoy reloading my own ammunition. So I found shooting a muzzleloader to be a similar pursuit. It was slower and a more methodical process. Each shot seemed to mean a little bit more because I sourced each component personally rather than just loading a cartridge off the shelf. I guess I can kind of relate it to cooking. Even if you follow a recipe, and even if it's a simple recipe, food that you make yourself is a bit more meaningful and more enjoyable to serve than takeout ordered from a popular restaurant. So I kind of view it the same way, sourcing the components, putting them together. It's kind of why I like building my own arrows, why I like reloading cartridges, Muzzleloader hunting kind of has a similar feel in that you know every little piece and you literally put each piece individually into the gun, so it just kind of feels a little bit more personal. One thing I do need to clarify real quick, this is a discussion relating to hunting with a muzzleloader primarily in Texas, though the rules here are similar throughout most of the South and the Midwest. The projectile and typically the propellant must be loaded from the muzzle and cannot be contained in a metallic case. This is different from a state like Pennsylvania where they have a primitive weapon season. So muzzleloader and primitive weapon don't necessarily mean the same thing. 
That requires hunters to use a round ball, not a conical shaped bullet, and a flintlock or a similarly fired weapon, prohibiting the use of modern primers. This is also notably different than states like Colorado that prohibit telescopic sights and require you to use open sights. Texas allows you to use all the fancy doodads you want as long as the weapon is ultimately still a muzzle loader. My first muzzle loader was a Remington 45 that I had purchased off of Craigslist. And I thought that was, this was pretty interesting because you cannot purchase a firearm normally off of Craigslist. Yeah, you'll see posts for boom booms and things like that every once in a while, or some trades will ultimately turn into you know, an exchange of firearms, but you cannot list a firearm on Craigslist. But a muzzle loader is not a firearm. So that's actually where I got it, and it was an old Remington, like I mentioned, that was modeled after the 700 bolt action, even though the bolt didn't really make sense on this gun because it was a muzzle loader. So the primer loading mechanism just kind of resembled a bolt. So you pulled back a bolt that just opened a small open area on the back where you loaded in your 209 shotgun primer and then closed it and locked it. And it actually had a very good trigger on it, and I think... I think a lot of this was because they had some sort of bolt mechanism, Remington could use the same sort of trigger mechanism that they use on their 700 series rifles. So that was my first muzzle loader. Uh, Shot it, messed around with it, learned from it a little bit. But locally, I was having a lot of trouble finding components that actually fit the 45 caliber muzzle loader. Seemed like around me, the 50 cal was a lot more popular. Even though we're talking about the same weight of projectiles, anywhere from 200 to 300. I mean, they go beyond 300, but I would say 250 is the biggest and most common chunk of the market. But 200 to 300 is the typical range. It just seemed like that was easier to find in a 50 cal. And at the time, I had also had somebody talk me into all the advantages of using preformed pellets rather than loose powder. And one thing that I kind of discovered about using preform pellets is the diameter should match the bore. So if you're shooting a 45 uh, caliber muzzle loader, you can't use 50 diameter pellets. Now, if you're shooting a 50, you can go the other way. You could go smaller, but that's kind of a more detailed discussion than we're talking about here. Ultimately, I was having trouble finding the pellets that I needed and the projectiles that I needed. And after messing around with that, I I was actually getting really good accuracy out of it, but I kind of struggled to maintain my gear. Uh, I have a shotgun that I clean maybe once a year after turkey season and deer season. And I just like gear that I can, I can run hard and not, I'm not worried about keeping it perfectly clean. And I know that's not the best habit, but ultimately that's the reality for trying to hunt so many different seasons, with so many different weapons. I can't spend all the time in the world cleaning and maintaining my gear. So in looking at muzzle loaders, I wanted to pick up something that was stainless because a lot of this powder is pretty corrosive. And when you burn black powder or black powder substitutes in a muzzle loader, you need to clean it very quickly or it can be quite a mess. So I ended up giving that 45 uh, Remington to my buddy Nate and picking up a different muzzle loader. It was a CVA Wolf which is one of their cheaper, more compact designs. Uh, It almost, I wouldn't say it's a youth version of a muzzleloader, but in the world of rifles, a lot of times the cheaper, shorter, more compact version of a rifle would be like the youth or Bantam model. So it's kind of like that. But I actually liked this because it came with an integrated scope mount because I pretty much knew I was going to put some sort of a scope on there. It didn't have irons, which I didn't really care about that much because if I was going to put a scope on there for sure, I wasn't going to need the irons. It was stainless. It was lightweight. It was short and compact. And so for me, I don't need a muzzleloader to be a tack driver weapon. I want something that's going to be better than a shotgun because this section of Forest Service land that I hunted, they don't allow centerfire rifles. So if you're going to hunt with a firearm in firearm season, it's a shotgun or a muzzleloader. And a shotgun is great at 50, 60, 70 yards. Now, obviously, shotgun systems can get as complicated as you want. There are rifled barreled shotguns that can run Sabo slugs that are bolt action designs like the Savage 212 and 220, I believe, 
is one I see that a lot of people are shooting long range, but I'm just talking about your average shotgun here, not some expensive, highly specialized deal. So for me, a muzzleloader was a way to have another weapon that I could take to these places that had a range that was much longer than a shotgun and could also potentially open me up to muzzleloader only seasons, other places in the state and even in other states. So I appreciated that this muzzleloader would give me better accuracy than a shotgun, but again, I didn't need something high end. I appreciated that it was lightweight, easy to carry, and because it was stainless, it would be a great option for public land where I'm likely carrying it a long ways, potentially getting stuck in the rain, sloshing through the mud, and ultimately muzzleloaders are such a pain in the rear to clean that that was going to be a huge advantage in not having uh, my rifle get all rusty and, and messed up. It also had a super lightweight nylon stock, and generally, I think nylon stocks are kind of ugly. I don't really like them, but when it's a device that I view as a tool, like my Mossberg 500 shotgun, for example, a lightweight stock is a great option. It doesn't need to look cool. It doesn't need to be fancy. And this also isn't a 300 yard and more precision rifle, so it doesn't need to be super rigid and free-floated and rock solid. A nylon stock is great for being lightweight, and ultimately, if it gets scratched, I don't care. (laughs) So that was an important part of my setup, something that was very durable. Also something that I didn't expect is in this muzzleloader, the trigger was surprisingly good for such a cheap muzzleloader. Now, it's not like my, you know, match target rifle or the trigger that I've tweaked a little bit on my 270 hunting rifle. It's not quite that good, but... It was way better than most shotgun triggers, and it was honestly better than I expected it to be for a $200 muzzleloader. One interesting thing that's a little bit fun to note, and I hinted at it earlier, is that a muzzleloader does not meet the legal definition of a firearm, so that they can in fact be mailed straight to your door without going to a gun shop or filling out a 4473 form. There are many places where felons who have been stripped of their right to own a firearm can still enjoy legal hunting and shooting by using a muzzleloader. So when I gave that uh, Remington 45 muzzleloader to my buddy Nate, so the optic that was on it, it was a True Glow scope. I believe it was a 4 to 12. It was either a 3 to 9 or a 4 to 12. And it had a BDC reticle, which seemed to closely match not exactly but closely approximate the ballistics of that 45 muzzleloader so not a super fancy scope but a great setup for an economical and accurate enough muzzleloader rig so i had given away that optic on that gun just because it was dialed in it was set up and so when i was getting this new cva wolf in it had a scope mount on it as i mentioned And about the same time, I had upgraded the optic on my 270 Winchester hunting rifle. So I kind of just passed my optics on down the line. So when I put the new, at the time, Leopold VX3i 3.5 to 10 on my 270 Winchester, I previously had a VX2, which was discontinued by Leopold at the time, even though it was great glass. Uh, it it just, I think they were phasing it out, getting rid of it. And so I realized the resale market wasn't going to be that great, even though it had a lifetime warranty and it was sharp glass. I said, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and hang on to this and just pass it on down to the muzzleloader. So that's a three to nine by 40. Now it's just a duplex reticle, no BDC, nothing muzzleloader specific about it at all, but that's fine. I don't, I'm not going to take super long shots where I need to know my drop at 300 yards. That's just not what I'm going to be doing with this gun. What was important to me was bright, sharp glass so that if I needed to make a 100-yard shot, I could really see what I was doing even at the last minute of legal light. So my first year of hunting with this rig, it was fun. On opening day, I was actually able to take a buck with this muzzleloader. Now, it wasn't a big one, but I'm sure proud of it just because it was my first deer on public land and my first deer with a muzzleloader and I think it was even my first buck it may have even been my first buck in Texas or at least my first buck in Texas in quite a while so I had walked out on opening day Uh, I had made just a tiny it wasn't even a full pop-up line but just kind of pulled some sticks in front of me 
And I think I had a piece of camo cloth that I kind of laid in front of the sticks. And I sat there, waited and watched uh, just kind of a trail crossroads. Didn't see anything. Um, And then I rattled, didn't see anything, waited a little while, rattled, didn't see anything. And then as I was getting up to leave, I had packed up my stuff, walking out. I guess it was about 25 or 30 minutes after I last rattled, I saw a buck coming running down the trail right towards me. So I think he heard the rattle. It just took him a long time to get there. And I was literally just standing up in the middle of the trail. He stopped and he was pretty much broadside, which was kind of lucky, honestly, um, that he was facing that direction. And he was looking at me. So turned sideways, but had his head turned looking at me. And I just pulled up the muzzle loader. Fortunately, I had the scoped out on the lowest power. I think a lot of people get way too excited about high magnification when they're at the range. But having the scope on only 3x was actually perfect here. So I pulled it up and he was at about 65 or 70 yards. So not a long shot. So I was able to freehand it and just boom, pump him right in the lungs with that muzzle loader. And what I appreciated about this is, yeah, it was kind of cool because it was opening day. It was my first year with a muzzle loader. But the blood trail was fantastic. So going through both lungs with a 250 grain hollow point, I did get a pass through. But that projectile is not going super fast. So it's not like a 270 or a 30-06 or a 25-06 that just zips right through. It just kind of goes slow, opens up, and just blows a huge hole. And so it's very effective, and it dumped a whole lot of blood with a double long shot. It looked like somebody had just opened up a paint can and just started walking with it. So tracking that buck was probably the easiest track job I have ever had with any, any sort of firearm where I ever had to actually track it. And what was cool was that buck actually went down right in front of my trail camera. So when I pulled that camera later, I actually had a picture of my dead deer laying right in front of it. So that was kind of cool, kind of a coincidental thing, or at least a little bit of a foreshadowing thing, uh, thinking back on my trail camera placement where I was thinking, well, there's probably deer here. And sure enough, I laid one down right in front of the camera. So that was a fun experience. And I had not gotten out to hunt public with that muzzleloader since then. Well, (laughs) I say that. I had one trip where me and my buddy Daniel were going to go out and spend one day out there. I hiked out with the muzzleloader, got halfway out, and realized I left my primers at the truck. And so I felt like an idiot. So fortunately, we had a shotgun with us as well. So we just kind of agreed he was going to have first shot with a shotgun. Then he was going to throw it over to me if there was another deer, and I was going to take a shot. So that was just kind of one day of goofing around in the woods, but I hadn't seriously hunted with that gun since I shot that buck. So years later, I pulled it back out and I wanted to get it just dialed in, make sure it was still shooting good. And just so that I was prepared in case I had a chance to hunt that same piece of public land again this year. So when I went to test it out, I found that the accuracy and reliability of that weapon were not quite what I remembered or what I expected. So I don't know how much of this was related to powder that had maybe been sitting for a while. Maybe it kind of gone bad, maybe exposed to some humidity. More likely, it was the fact that years ago, I was just trying to get my muzzle loader working. I was just looking at it as a 50-yard weapon that, can I hit a deer with this? Yeah, I think so. Okay, let's go. (laughs) I wasn't very picky about what I was doing back then. So when I was at the range, I wanted a muzzleloader that reliability was number one. I wanted to make sure that when I shoved powder down that and crammed a bullet in it, put a primer in, that it was going to go boom and not not just a fizzle pop, but a good, consistent, full power boom every time. So I wanted to be very consistent, very reliable. And then beyond that, I wanted to get the best accuracy I could with reasonably priced components. I was very happy with the glass that I had on the rig, so I didn't think that was the issue. This was not really a high-end muzzleloader, and it had a fairly short barrel. I knew that this was certainly not going to be the most accurate muzzleloader possible, but I did appreciate how lightweight and compact it was. And while it wasn't going to be incredible on the accuracy side of things, I knew it could be much better than the accuracy that I was currently experiencing. So if I was going to change anything to get better results, it wasn't the optic, it was the load that was the most natural suspect. I had been running white hot pellets. Uh, I don't remember who actually makes that, but uh, 
Previously on the 45, I had been running 777 preform pellets because they made a 45 diameter. The white hot, I could only find them in a larger diameter, but they seemed to be a little cheaper. I had heard that they burned cleaner. I hadn't really noticed much of a difference when I switched from one brand to the other. Um, both ultimately are just a preform pellet. And the reason I was attracted to that idea was with a preform pellet, you don't have to worry about measuring. You just drop two, they're 50 grains each. So if you want a hundred grain charge, you just drop two in there and you're good to go. So I was enticed by just the simplicity of having one less thing to worry about. Um, not having to pour messy powder in the field or having any chance of mismeasuring because I didn't have to measure at all. You just take two pellets, drop them in there. But what I had experienced in convenience, I thought would ultimately result in better consistency because I didn't have to measure. They were all going to be preformed. But what I saw is that those white hot pellets just were not as consistent and were not as accurate as I was expecting. Now, I know also with these pellets, you shouldn't touch them with your hands. The oil in your fingers can gradually soak into the pellet and make it a little bit less consistent. That may have been an issue too, because if you're trying to not pour and not touch anything, it's actually a little harder than you would expect to pull these out and load them with not touching anything. Also, I realized one advantage uh, of the pellets, or what I thought was an advantage, not having to pour or measure, meant I was carrying around these pellets in these little tubes to carry them and hiking around a lot, jostling them around in my bag. They ended up kind of breaking up anyway. Um, so the idea of it being a solid compact thing kind of fell apart and degraded with how I was actually using my stuff. And so then when you load it in there, you don't want to compress your charge because if you have 100 grains by volume loaded and the bullet is seated differently or the powder is compressed differently, you're not going to be consistent. And so that just took away an advantage, again, from what I thought was a nice, easy-to-use preform pellet. I had also been running Thompson Center Sabo slugs. And just a quick detour, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, a Sabo is basically a plastic sleeve, kind of like the wad that you would find in a shotgun shell that goes around the bullet. This allows you to use an undersized bullet inside of the plastic sleeve, and this makes it much easier to load and push down the bore. This also allows manufacturers to use smaller, more readily available bullet diameters. So for example, in a 50 caliber muzzle loader, the bullet itself is actually 45 caliber, but wrapped in a sleeve that brings it up closer to 50. So obviously there are a lot of 45 caliber bullets on the market. So this allows them to use that cheaper bullet that they're already producing for something else, put it in this plastic sleeve and cram it down the tube. And then when you shoot, that plastic sleeve actually grips the rifling and imparts spin on the bullet rather than the bullet itself gripping the rifling. So I was using those uh, Sabo slugs by Thompson Center And Thompson Center, they're owned by Smith & Wesson, I believe, but they make a lot of good muzzleloader components. So I was thinking, hey, if I stick with a known name brand in the muzzleloader section in the industry, it's probably going to be a pretty good option. And this was what I used to kill that buck on public land years ago, the white hot pellets and that bullet. Now, obviously, that bullet was incredibly effective on an animal. But I don't think that was necessarily intrinsic of the bullet design itself as much as just the idea of a big, heavy projectile hitting an animal at 1,800 to 2,000 feet per second. So it's not zipping through, but it's not slow either. I think just that formula and any hollow point bullet is what did the damage. So looking at my setup, I was still using the preform pellets, so I couldn't really manipulate the load that much. I couldn't say, hey, let's add 10% or subtract 10%. I was kind of stuck with what I had. So the first thing I wanted to try was just loading a different brand bullet just to see if I got any different results. And admittedly, I'm kind of a sucker for anything with a big H on the packaging. I'm not sponsored or endorsed by Hornady, nothing like that. But just I've had so many good results with Hornady ammo that when I saw that they made a 250 grain SST muzzleloader bullet, I said, that's one to try. Brought it home. And then after comparing it to the Thompson Center, I saw that they were so similar I don't know. At the point, I was just wanting to try a different brand, and I saw Hornady on something, and it gave me some confidence. 
and ultimately I didn't experience much of a difference in accuracy. I got about the same results, and in hindsight, looking at the projectiles and looking at the Sabos, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Hornady is actually manufacturing those projectiles for Thompson Center, but just finishing them out with yellow tips and yellow Sabo sleeves instead of Hornady red, because they looked so similar in the design. And ultimately, I didn't really see much of a difference in that projectile. So at this point, I wanted to try changing the propellant. So I went away from the white hot preform pellets to using loose powder. Obviously, this whole industry and shooting style started with loose powder. So I kind of viewed this as, hey, let's go back to the basics. Let's start over. Let's avoid the hype of these preform pellets and just get back to how this whole thing started. So when I was changing powders, obviously there are several different ones on the market, but a newer one that I had heard a lot of good things about was Blackhorn 209. So this is a black powder substitute made in Canada specifically for inline muzzleloaders that use 209 shotgun primers, which is what I was using, is what most of these modern muzzleloaders use. Now, the good things I had heard were about the cleanliness and consistency of this powder. It didn't have a bunch of just black char in the barrel after you shot. It was a little cleaner and it was very consistent from one shot to the next. So to me, that sounded like a winning formula and it sounded like a good thing to try. Now, keep in mind using preform pellets up until this point, I had never been measuring my powder. It was just take two pellets out of the box, toss them in there. So in switching to loose powder, I had to learn the difference in really how you measure muzzleloader powder and the difference in measuring by weight versus measuring by volume. And this was a little bit confusing to me, especially with all these modern black powder substitutes. So most of what you find in a store is a black powder substitute. It's not actually black powder. It works generally the same way, but it's more shelf-stable. It's a little bit better to ship. Uh, It's less likely to be damaged by humidity. So it's just a modern mixture that kind of simulates the exact same propellant effect as black powder, just safer to stock and ship. Now, with these modern synthetics, the densities are significantly different. And so that's where it gets interesting. Because when somebody says 100 grains of black powder, they're talking about weight, Originally, they're talking about weighing out 100 grains of black powder and then pouring that volume into the bore of a muzzleloader or into some sort of powder measure or container to store it. When you switch to these synthetics, they're talking about equivalence. We're talking about a volume that's equivalent to the weight of 100 grains of black powder. And so where that gets interesting is if you measure out 100 grains by weight, That could potentially be a very powerful and dangerous load with these synthetics. And it got confusing to me because grains is a measure of weight, not a measure of volume. And so when somebody says 100 grains by volume, I was like, what the heck are you talking about? That's like saying, how tall is that guy? Well, 170 pounds tall. Uh, That doesn't make any sense. So when I realized that they were talking about the equivalent in black powder, it started making a little bit more sense. And so what I found to be really helpful is some plastic vials that were pre-measured, almost like a measuring cup that you would use for cooking, but in a skinny vial. So up the side of this vial, it had 50, 60, 90, 100, 110, 120 markings printed on it that were black powder volume equivalencies. I found that helpful because it, it took me away from worrying about grains by weight and basically just said, hey, Fill it up to 100, that's the recommended charge load for what I'm doing. It helped me feel confident and safe about what I was doing. Because the whole measure by volume, measure by weight thing could be really confusing, especially if you reload cartridges, modern cartridges using smokeless powder, where you're always measuring everything by weight. So I was able to wrap my head around that. I got those preformed tubes, which helped me a lot, poured a 100 grain equivalent in all of those, got it loaded, and took that to the range. After switching to the loose Blackhorn 209 powder, the gun felt more consistent and more reliable. I had fewer hang fires, the the fizzle pop effect, and I noticed that my bore was cleaner from one shot to the next. So cleaning these things can be such a nightmare that if it seemed to remain cleaner, that was going to be a huge help in consistency. 
So consistency is obviously a huge part in accuracy, but it wasn't all of the story here. So the accuracy may have improved slightly, but not much. I was still shooting around a 6 to 8 inch group at 100 yards. Again, I did not expect this gun to shoot a minute of angle group like my 270, but I knew it could be a lot better than what I was getting. So it seemed like the change to loose powder was a good change, but not a total solution to what I had been experiencing and how I could improve upon it. So at this point, I said, okay, I've tried two different projectiles that were basically the same design. Let me try a design that's totally different. So I switched over to a power belt bullet. So this is a newer bullet design that does not need a Sabo. So it's a tipped bullet, so essentially a hollow point with a plastic tip up front. So it flies like a full metal jacket, but then when it hits something, it expands like a hollow point. So I like that idea. But instead of having a Sabo, it was full diameter. So it was the exact size of my bore. It didn't need a plastic wrapping around it but it had a little plastic or almost rubberized skirt on the back of the bullet. So the idea here is that when you load it down, it, it fits exactly your bore diameter. So it's fairly easy to load, not super easy. It's still, there's still a little bit of friction and you still need a little bit of force, but it's the exact diameter of your bore. But then when the charge goes off, this plastic skirt gets pushed and opens up and expands to be really tight in the bore. And so that actually helps the bullet grip the rifling as it's fired. So I liked this idea a lot just because it was easier to load. There's one piece I have to deal with, not two. So there's no chance that I drop a Sabo and now I can't load my bullet. Nothing like that. Now, what I didn't like about it is they were notably more expensive. They're more than a dollar a bullet, which kind of stinks. But I realized a muzzleloader isn't a rapid fire weapon where I'm going to be shooting a whole lot of ammo. So I was kind of okay with it, and it seemed like it was just a design that was a little cleaner and a little simpler. Now, again, if you're in Pennsylvania or I think Colorado makes you use a round ball, there are a lot of states where this power belt bullet is prohibited. You have to use a round ball with a patch or a sabo. Um, so this design, because it was legal in my area, I wanted to take advantage of it. I saw it as just a way to simplify my setup and hopefully... If it's simpler, that means there are fewer variables to chase and I can get better accuracy. So I went with a 250 grain arrow tip is what they call their kind of hollow point poly tip design power belt bullet. So this change seemed to make a huge difference in my rig. And again, I don't think there was any problem with the other bullet. Obviously, it flew decently well. The effect on an animal was astounding, to be honest. But ultimately, I think there were a lot of bullets that could do the trick. So I just needed something that was going to shoot a little bit more accurately in my gun. I'm sure there are other guns out there that just love those Hornady SSTs and do well. It just didn't seem like the best fit for my rig. And so I don't know if that was a barrel length or twist rate. I don't know really what the difference was. I was just kind of test lots of things, see what works the best. So after trying that power belt bullet, it seemed absolutely worthwhile to make the switch. Now, I know there are guys who hunt out west with muzzleloaders and really need them to be long-range rifles and guys who can shoot minute-of-angle groups and regularly shoot two and even 300 yards with their muzzleloaders. And again, that's not what I was really aiming for. Where I'm hunting, I think it's going to be pretty rare to get a shot over 150 yards. So I wanted something where at 100 to 150 I can feel a huge gain in accuracy over a shotgun, but I still had a gun that was lightweight, compact, and gave me a whole lot of confidence when hiking it way back into the far side of public land to hopefully take a shot at a white-tailed deer. So something I also don't want to dismiss, and it, it's a nagging reminder to me when I had hiked about, I don't know, half a mile into public land and realized I didn't have any primers with me or in my truck, it highlighted the importance of just keeping all your crap together. When you're hunting with a centerfire rifle, it's, okay, you've got your rifle, you've got some bullets in, in the box magazine or loaded down in the internal magazine, you're good to go. What else do you need? Maybe shooting sticks? If you forget shooting sticks, still not that big of a deal. But there's not a lot to keep up with. It's pretty simple. But when you're hunting with a muzzleloader, you have to remember, do you have your primers? Do you have your bullets? Do you have your powder? 
Do you have your ramrod? If you're using a short ramrod, how are you going to start the thing? Are you going to use a short starter or are you going to try to use your ramrod? So at the range, this isn't a real big deal. I just have a 30 cal plastic ammo can, just like I keep all my other stuff in. And I keep all my muzzleloader stuff together. Now, one thing to note here, if you keep cleaning solvents, you don't want to store those with your primers because they can degrade primers and I think even powders. Um, so you don't want to keep cleaning chemicals in the same box as your projectiles and your primers and powder. But otherwise, I kept all my stuff together in one big ammo can. So nice and convenient, but not so much when you're hiking this back in the woods. It may work at the range, but obviously you're not going to lug that whole big box with you just to be able to reload your gun. So I ended up finding a small nylon pouch, just one of those types that has a zipper that goes about three quarters of the way around it, opens up like a book. And it actually fit a primer tray perfectly. So I was able to use that pouch and I kind of made a little muzzleloader field kit. And to me, I guess I'm just ADD enough that this is extremely helpful. If I can just remember one thing that's got my kit that has everything I need and is ready to go, no problem. But if I have to remember all these little components, that's probably going to be an issue and I'm probably going to forget my primers again. So in this pack, I open it up. And I have a little pocket inside that, as I mentioned, perfectly fits the whole tray of primers. I know I don't need this many primers out with me, but if I have a whole tray, it stores them in a nice organized way that I'm not going to lose them. They're not going to be rolling around, getting dinged up, which could be dangerous with primers. And they're just going to stay organized, stay clean, stay dry. So I've got that. And then I have five of those vials of pre-measured Blackhorn 209 powder, all poured to 100 grains in their little vial, nice, organized, ready to pour straight into the bore. So keeping that clean, keeping that organized, and that way I also don't have to bring a large jug of powder when I'm not going to use most of it and I'm going to have to measure it in the field. Better to measure it at home, keep it in these pre-formed vials, and then just take one, pour it down the bore when I'm ready to use it. And then there's a little pouch in there that I keep the bullets. So because I had six powder charges, I said, let's put six bullets in there just so I've got an equal match of everything. Um, now there is a weird chance that maybe the powder wouldn't be good. I'd have to pour the powder out, but I could salvage the bullet. But that's not likely. And six shots is way more than I'm probably going to ever need. Hopefully I'll take one shot and be dragging out a deer. And thinking optimistically... I also included some zip ties in there and a pin just in case I need to fill out my tag and strap that tag onto an animal. So that way I had everything I needed. And one thing that I kind of added at the last minute was a short starter. So it's like a, almost like a nylon ball that has a little stem that has a rounded inside. So it just helps it to be a little bit easier to start the loading of the bullet down the bore. Because if you're using a ramrod, you can use an extra long ramrod with a jag on the end of it that helps you load the bullet and it's nice and easy to get started but in the field just having that short starter to just push it an inch down the bore that's very helpful especially with that round ball nose on it that you can really push your hand into the hardest part's getting it started so that short starter while i have the pouch open to get the bullet out it's right there so i can get it started put it all back in the pouch then use my ramrod and finish everything up so that was a last minute addition, but I feel like with that kit, as long as I don't forget the whole kit, I've got everything I need. So now I'm feeling pretty good about my muzzleloader setup. I know that I can shoot about a two or three inch group at 100 yards, which is great. And I've got that little pouch that has all my gear in it, so I can't possibly forget anything. I can stay nice, organized, and hopefully reload pretty quickly in the woods. So I am pretty much ready to go. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I hope if you're getting interested in muzzleloaders or you just want to learn more about it or you want to learn just kind of some of my thoughts behind switching over to a muzzleloader, maybe you can hear some of my mistakes or things I've learned along the way and not have to learn a lesson yourself. Hopefully that's helpful. And hopefully you just enjoy kind of these conversations dorking out about gear and finding new ways to hunt, new ways to shoot, and new ways to just get out and enjoy this kind of stuff because it is a heck of a lot of fun. But right now, it's actually muzzleloader season. And guess what? It's the day after Thanksgiving. I don't have to work. So by the time you're listening to this, I'm probably out in the woods slinging that muzzleloader over my shoulder, walking out to a place where I can hopefully take a crack at a deer. So again, I hope you enjoyed this. Until next time, stay safe, be free, and never stop seeking adventure. Wow.